The good things for me is that the human psyche is the most marvelous organ which we don't understand as much as any other organ in the human body. It's an area of continuing exploration which will, as far as I can see, carry on for decades and centuries to come. We're only just beginning to understand it. So we're at the forefront of a branch of medicine, psychology if you like, which is just in its infancy and it's so exciting. The good things in terms of the sector is that addiction, addiction, substance use problems, whatever you want to call it today, they're treatable and increasingly we're getting better at treating these problems, much, much better. And we've probably got as much as anybody, Bill W, to thank for that. You know, he highlighted the fact that addictions are treated. Up until that time, doctors especially used to write off people with addictions and say, we don't know what to do. So we now have a sector who, we have some skills in treating very, very disabling and life-threatening disorders. So that's good. And there's a lot of research being done. We understand so much more about the neurobiology of addictions now and the neuroanatomical defects which occur. That can only be good in the long run. There's the helper component, um, one alcoholic talking to another alcoholic and being listened to. And um, that's something which for me as a health professional, I can't listen in the same way, having not been an alcoholic or a substance dependent person. Um, and I think the experience of being listened to by someone who knows is marvelously therapeutic. There is no payment involved, you know, and you can do it within all sorts of settings. I think that aspect of AA is marvelously important. Psychologically, 12 steps make sense. They are a cognitive therapeutic intervention um, which are beautifully stepped so that each step flows from one into another. Moving from one step into the next is relatively easy to do. It's not easy doing the 12 steps, um, but from a psychological perspective, they make complete and utter sense. And from a behavioral perspective, complete and utter sense. From a psychotherapeutic perspective, complete sense. The beautiful thing about the 12 steps and the whole AA structure is that there's a spiritual component to it as well. And it's hard, it's hard working in the mental health sector to talk easily about the spiritual component, but the spiritual component is vitally important. It's central to the whole structure of AA. And we've, I think we're just beginning to get evidence um, from the literature that the spiritual component has its own validity. What is spirituality? It's the vivifying, the en enlivening principle which makes us tick, which is something more than just my I-ness. It's a spiritual focus in life, moves me towards meaning, moves me towards wholeness. So the search for something spiritual within my life is an acknowledgement that there's a transcendent meaning, if you like, something which is bigger than me. And if you go to the first step, I'm not in control of my drinking. So if I'm not in control, something else is. And immediately, as soon as you say that, you're beginning to introduce the concept of spirituality. If it's not me, what is it? It might be something within me, but it's not something that I'm currently in control of. So the exploration starts at that moment. And that for me is the spirituality. And however you explore that is valid for every individual in whatever way they do it. It's a desensitization. It's you start with simple steps and move forward from a behavioral perspective, a desensitizing approach to something which is feared is powerful psychology. It's effective, meaningful, and good way to go. Cognitive approach, 
um, you get into the third, fourth, fifth steps and you're beginning to make a full and complete moral in inventory. You're telling your story. Tell your story, you, as you tell your story and you begin to tell your story in a meaningful way to you, you develop narrative competence, you begin to own the person that you are with warts and all basic psychology. One of, one of the delightful things about going to a meeting is that you go around in circles and everybody says their name and the whole group says hello, hello Bill, hello Rob, and I go around and say hi I'm Tom, I'm a visitor, and everybody says hello Tom, and you feel warm and accepted and it's non-conditional positive regard. And there you have Carl Rogers from the 60s and 70s. One of the most powerful components of psychotherapy is that unconditional positive regard. Every time I go to a meeting, I get that. I get accepted unconditionally for being the person that I am, warts and all. And for an alcoholic, you know, what more could you want? You know, I'm a shitty person who's done horrible things being an alcoholic, and here's a group of people accepting me. There's, there's this lovely idea called credo containment, where you're contained by the creed, if you like the creed of the 12 steps. And if that works, then great. And how wonderful for it to work and for you not to need anything more. And you know, th th those people are blessed not to have to go and suffer the torments of exploring themselves in any other way. I suppose it's much harder to identify the early warning signs of the human psyche not functioning particularly well until you've hit rock bottom. And as you come back up again, you learn those early warning signs. I think it's, it's that much harder for us. We don't focus on our psychological functioning in the way that we focus on our physical functioning. So AA, AA, um, AA I think, um, works whether you've hit rock bottom or not. It's just that for a lot of people, the idea of starting with AA before you've hit rock bottom is a difficult step to take because you have to acknowledge that life is not as good as it could be. And most people, I think, join AA once life has become pretty rotten. Not everybody has an epiphany. And for other people, it's a slow, arduous task of work and sometimes people engage in the work not knowing if they're going to come right and they engage and it'll be months, sometimes many months later before they begin to get a little hint of perhaps something changing. Works differently for every single different person and for those people who have an epiphany, great, marvellous and um, it's, they're, they're blessed. Um, often they've hit rock bottom before they have the epiphany. For other people they never have an epiphany and they just go through a very dark night of the soul which lasts for months and months and months and then there's a little bit of a glimmer and for the therapist, the therapist holds that person or the AA group holds that person for many, many months before the light begins to burn a bit more brightly. There's the, there's the reliance on the power of the ego to carry us through all sorts of difficult situations and we expect that to work because it seems to work for everybody else. And it's a very humbling moment to recognize that I can't do this anymore and all our perceptions of ourselves suddenly get challenged. You know, my, my concept of myself is, oh, I can't do this anymore. That's supremely, not just humbling, but I suspect humiliating. I, I suspect when you hit rock bottom, you feel completely and utterly alone. And suddenly to realize that you're not alone, that you are one of many and that you are accepted. Oh, I mean, that's what I like about going to an AA group, even though I'm not an alcoholic. I say, hi, I'm Tom, I'm a visitor. Hi, Tom. <gasps> it's a great feeling, you know, and the power of that acceptance is huge. We live in a secular society in which religious focus is denigrated and um, there is a perception in the wider community that AA is a religious organization. And given that 
quotes, God died. Some years ago, the idea of going to a, an organization in which God is alive and well, God as we understand him is alive and well, is anathema. So completely and utterly understandable that people should veer away from an organization which doesn't fit in with the current societal expectations of how we can live our lives. That's, I think, for me, is the biggest turn-off for most people, and certainly when I mention it in my everyday practice, I get responses, I'm not going to that bunch of religious fanatics who run a cult, and, you know, it's often one or two or three sessions um, later when you've explored all of those concepts and explored the concept of spirituality and the idea that perhaps God, as we understand him, might be something within that people begin to shift or begin to shift. Not everybody, and that's fine. But for me, that's the biggest barrier. And it's, it's not an insurmountable barrier, but it's unfortunate that that's how it is. Now, I'm not, you know, necessarily suggesting that the 12 steps change in their wording because that's unlikely to happen. Um, but I think, I think that's a barrier, but it's one that can be overcome relatively easily. And it's not just work that I do with my patients, sometimes introducing them to an AA member and they can sit down and talk, um, having someone who can do that work well with my, with my patients is invaluable. The starting point is that I'm a human being. The person sitting opposite me is another human being who at this moment in time has a problem. Hopefully I don't have a problem and I can be of some assistance. And it's a story that my patient tells me. And they tell me a narrative. <coughs> and I try and help them make sense of that narrative. For my patients who come to me, the narrative invariably involves a substance use problem as well as other psychological difficulties. And within the telling of the narrative, we try and develop an understanding how those substance use problems and the psychological problems interweave and reinforce each other and which started when perhaps and so on and so forth. And it becomes a hypothesis about how the problems developed. And as long as we can work on that hypothesis, then we can test it. And we can test various interventions along the way. And if that intervention helped, then the narrative begins to change, and so on. Now, you can talk about diagnoses, if you like, till the cows come home. And that, for me, probably helps, because I have structures in my mind which say, oh yeah, if that person's had this type of symptom and that type of sign, and then it's likely that they're suffering from this type of problem. The, it's naming the problem. Now, the naming is often the therapeutic intervention. I'm an alcoholic, I have PTSD. If my patients own that and they can name it, then there's another piece of work that be, can be done. But the first piece of work is to explore the narrative to get to that stage of naming the problem. We may not name it as a diagnosis. We may name it as a, an array of various symptoms and phenomena, and that for some people is sufficient, as long as it makes sense and we can work out something that can be done to help with those particular types of problems and presentations, then that's the work. The nice thing about pills, if I get pneumonia and I go and see my doctor, he gives me some antibiotics for my pneumonia, it kills the bugs and I get better. I probably need to go away and think about why I got pneumonia in the first place and do something about that. Um, I'm not going to knock my antibiotics because pneumonia is a life-threatening condition and the death rates from pneumonia before the era of antibiotics was phenomenally high. If we get a pill that helps me, great. I won't knock it um, for whatever the condition. You know, pills for schizophrenia, they've transformed the treatment of schizophrenia. If there's a pill that helps with addiction, great. But don't forget to do the psychological work afterwards. Now, the only risk with pills is that they're so good, or they may become so good, that I won't 
have the um, interest in doing the psychological work afterwards, well, that's at my peril and that's the risk. But you weigh it up. Talking about black and white thinking, there's a polarity between drugs and hedonism and the need or the perceived need to prohibit access to drugs and that discussion is not sufficiently overt yet. We, there is a lot of anxiety at a national and international level about that polarity which drives a lot of, um, a lot of lawmaking which I think I think this quite strongly. Um, I think that affects our capacity to help people with their substance use problems because we forget that substance use problems are a health problem as opposed to a criminal problem. And it's changing. We're getting there. There's a lot of public health work to be done in the addictions field as well as the individual work that we do with our patients. That'll come. Uh, but that's, 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 that's work that has to be done about creating some grayness at a national and international level as opposed to a black and whiteness and reducing collective anxiety. You're walking into the unknown, which is frightening. Um, that's what you're walking into. And what you can expect, you can expect warmth, acceptance, and <coughs> and some difficult days ahead when you begin to explore some of those things that you've been unwilling to explore which have led you down the path of becoming substance dependent. But the warmth and the acceptance, I think, will override some of the fears that you have. And having the courage to pursue some of the AA structures, well, we know it works. 0800 AA works. We know this. It's been around. And if it works for you, great. If the first group you go to doesn't work, try another group. Every single group is different. Talk to the AA people individually and keep on going until you find something that works for you. AA is not a religion, first and foremost. It's not a dogmatic set of doctrines that you have to believe in. So it's not a religion. It's not a cult. It doesn't, it doesn't um, link itself to any particular form of religion, any denomination, and as a result, you can't make it a cult. Um, you can't be entrapped within it. You can walk away whenever you want, and there are no, quotes, cult qualities to AA. Now, having said that, some of the groups will find themselves working within Christian type structures because that's what that particular group works with and it works for them. And if that works for that group, great. Um, if it doesn't work for you, there will be another group around which will work for you. There is no top-down leadership. The leadership is the group and the individual. And the groups and the individuals feed up to the delegates who feed up to the next level, who feed up to the national level, and the national level feeds up to the international level. And that's where the power lies. The power lies with the individual and with the group. And it's a very effective structure because change, is, change occurs then from a consensus perspective. And when it changes, it's a meaningful change.